Greetings once again and welcome. Uh, it may be a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on wherever you are in the four corners of the world. It's me again, Professor Godo Namo, your course director, wishing you well as you view and listen to this recording. Today we are on module three, course one, dealing with policy frameworks and incentives for climate and carbon markets. So far, you have, or you should have, gone through the recorded material on module one, course one, which dealt with climate change drivers and historical development of the climate and carbon markets. And module two, course one, that looked at the post-Kyoto protocol climate and carbon markets. Let's get on now with module three of course one, which is looking at the policy frameworks and incentives for climate and carbon markets. Our presentation outline or recording outline is as follows. Module learning outcomes and skills gained. I'll look at module objectives and topics. Overview on the anatomy of carbon markets policy and regulatory environment. Carbon taxation and design, quite an interesting topic, that one. Tax incentives and subsidies solutions, quite an interesting topic as well. And lastly, we'll look at design and ongoing emissions trading schemes. Now, the reason why we are also going to focus on emissions trading schemes is you might never know there could be some other African countries that want to institute such emissions trading schemes, or uh, some countries might want to partner. Remember, uh, in the party agreement, you are allowed to actually have partners that you can design emissions trading schemes with or any other carbon uh, uh, market mechanisms with. You might also want to have a regional uh, emissions trading scheme or with now the new uh, continental free trade area, African continental free trade area, we might actually decide to do have our own African emissions trading scheme. Now, the module learning outcomes and skills or, uh, or skills objectives and the topics to be covered are as follows. Our learning outcomes and skills gained, we are expecting that by the end of this module, participants will be able to fully understand the overview of the anatomy of carbon market policy and regulatory environment, fully grasp how carbon taxes are developed and designed, understand the tax incentives and subsidies that have been implemented to date or some that are ongoing, understand the design and ongoing emissions of, uh, understand the design of ongoing emissions trading schemes in different countries. We are also expecting you to have familiarized yourselves with review and adjust policy and institutional frameworks for climate and carbon markets including regulatory mandates, incentives, and market-driven solutions, improve Africa's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that's contributing to climate-compatible and climate-resilient development without compromising Africa's growth trajectory, set up tangible climate and carbon markets for Africa at national, regional, and international levels in line with the Paris Agreement. Now, in terms of the module uh, uh, content, um, uh, uh, module content, what is interesting here is um, we have got the object, two objectives that we have set for this uh, uh, module to establish the readiness in policy and institutional frameworks for climate and carbon markets, including regulatory mandates, incentives, and market-driven solutions to enhance Africa's greenhouse gas emissions reduction efforts, uh, thereby contributing to climate compatible and climate resilient development. There are four major topics that are going to cover. And these include number one, an overview on the anatomy of carbon markets, policy and regulatory environment, carbon taxation and design, tax incentives and subsidies solutions. Then we are going to look at design and, uh, 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 and ongoing emissions trading schemes. Let's look at section one, which is an overview on the anatomy of carbon markets. So when we speak of the anatomy of the carbon market policy and regulatory environment, we by default get to address readiness pillars for such an environment. So maybe some of us when you're growing, uh, when we're still young, uh, we, 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 we were involved in athletics, 
and know you as an athlete, you have to prepare before the, the, the whistle and even you have to be prepared during the race. So we are we are almost like simulating the same circumstances. We are saying as a continent, it's not going to be practical for us to get uh, uh, involved in the carbon climate markets or scale up carbon markets if we are not ready for such an engagement. And as such, it is important for us then to speak about this readiness pillars. I'll recap because I, I introduced them in, in, in module one, if I'm not mistaken. But today, I think I will just emphasize a bit on the means of implementation. To this end, the policy and regulatory environment is but one of the many readiness pillars we consider. Other pillars of interest are actually highlighted in this uh, next slide. And of course, like I indicated there, we have things like digital technology platform, research and development R&D, monitoring, reporting, and verification, institutional capacity for early engagement, high-level political and management buy-ins, education awareness and networking, policies and regulatory frameworks, and lastly, the finance programs and projects on the ground. Now, what is interesting there, uh, it will be so difficult for us to say we are familiar with the climate and carbon markets if we don't have projects that are running on the ground. So that's why I'm saying programs there and projects are quite important. And also is a note that I have pitched in this presentation from the readiness pillars identified, identified herein, the following also fall under the means of implementation, funding, finance, enhancing capacity, education and awareness raising. So at times in your quizzes, we can set uh, questions like, uh, um, which of the readiness pillars talk of, of means of implementation? Then you, you should know that we are talking about finance, you are talking about enhancing capacity, you are talking about uh, education and awareness. You might also even want to include technology uh, there if it's one of the options. Now, in its 2021 report, the Inter International Emissions Trading Association, a global voice of business on carbon markets established in 1999, highlighted that the European Union and New Zealand started making changes on their carbon markets to be more ambitious ahead of COP26. Now, from COP26, that's where we got our Paris Agreement. So the, the, the way that we see coming constantly in our talks is ambition. So it may not even only be in the carbon markets, but in addressing climate change overall, we speak a lot around ambition or ambitious targets because in the past, we have seen that those ambitious targets were not coming through. So this is now a common terminology that you, you will come across even possibly at, your, at national level or at the continental level, that whatever we're going to do in terms of climate change, addressing climate change, we need really to ramp up. There should be ambition or there should be ambitious targets in what we are doing. In addition, new markets started operating, including China's national emissions trading scheme, which is interesting, China is a developing nation, with other markets where in the process of being developed, such as those in Colombia and Chile. So the growing and strong interest in voluntary markets were being propelled by surging corporate moves to net zero emissions by 2050. Like I indicated earlier on, the major uh, 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 producers of harmful greenhouse gases is the corporate world. So as such, we were seeing major industries, cement manufacturing, general manufacturing, oil and gas, steel industry, we are even retail, agriculture, we are seeing them committing to net zero by 20 emissions by 2050. So that on its own is also creating a very huge carbon market in the form of the voluntary carbon market. And you're going to see industry getting involved a lot in the carbon markets and as an African continent or within your country, there is no way in which you can leave the industry or captains of industry, chambers of commerce, when are talking about designing a carbon a, 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 a emissions program or a carbon taxation program, because these are the key stakeholders in the in the space when are dealing with uh, the climate and carbon markets. Transparency and accountability remain crucial to maintain confidence in environmental integrity in the carbon market. So you discover there, you, 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 when you're going to design a, a system uh, in the carbon market, there is this idea that people 
want to see transparency. They also want to see accountability. So the, the reason why we want to see transparency, like even at global level, so we don't want then people to start claiming what they've not done and then earning credit that they don't have. It could be credits in the form of carbon credits, or it could be credit in the form of their own businesses. Then, you know, people are saying, okay, such and such a bank is doing wonderfully well, such and such a company or such and such a chain, a retail chain is doing excellently well in terms of addressing climate change. So we can't say that if there's no transparency and if also there's no accountability. As such, a market without trust will never be successful. So when we talk about the carbon market, and then it does not trust the system, then it's not going to be successful. So even if we're going to get our own African carbon market or your own national emissions trading scheme, then it they should they should be trust with within the system so that also the key stakeholders can say, I can get involved in this and I can contribute towards addressing climate change, especially on the mitigation side. So drawing from Article 6, uh, in in intentionally transferred mitigation outcomes uh, that demand corresponding adjustments in national inventories for nationally determined contributions or other global greenhouse gas abatement uh, purposes, only Japan, Switzerland, South Korea, New Zealand, and Aust Austria indicated interest in buying those ITMOs to help meet their indices. So the indices, remember I spoke about the indices, nationally determined contributions where your greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets are set. So they are saying that we, we, we need also to bring ambition in those uh, uh, in indices. Now, what is interesting uh, from the IETA is uh, the, what they were calling, uh, we need to be aware of the, the, the key trends or, or, or the, the key developments or movements in the in, in the carbon uh, 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 market environment. And there are many, you can read them on your own. If you can get hold of that uh, publication, you can actually see some of them. I just said to pick four of these key trends. So this, so apart from the, some of the key trends, trend one, uh, uh, the, uh, the IETA says carbon prices are on the rise. Now, it's one of the issues that we need to understand is as, 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 the, as the Africans and African governments and participants. So what do we mean when I say carbon prices are on the rise? Prices for allowances in cap and trade programs worldwide are going up. The most significant example of this trend is the European Union trading scheme, um, but also there's also the North American carbon markets, especially the West Climate Initiative, usually abbreviated WCI, which includes the state of California, and also Northeastern Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. There's also seeing ever higher carbon prices as in the New Zealand Emissions Trading Scheme. Next graph for is just showing you the trend in terms of what has been happened to the uh, happening to the carbon market. This from January September 2021, and you can see that the trend has been going up. You can tra uh, trace them. I think the one that has been uh, going up nicely is the European Emissions Trading Scheme. Uh, also, the uh, WCI, uh, it has been uh, the California one, it is also going uh, going up nicely. Then, of course, the other GGI as well, I spoke about earlier on, it has been going up nicely. But also see those ones that are coming pilot for the Chinese, not so much of a, a smooth uh, curve, but I think it's also showing an upward trend. Then you see also even the South Korea uh, emissions trading scheme coming in there and, and going up nicely. So when you're considering maybe some of the African countries that might want to uh, experiment with this emissions trading scheme, maybe talk about South Africa, Nigeria, um, Kenya, maybe all these uh, regional, uh, so-called regional powerhouses, but there's no harm in even other countries trying also to experiment on this emissions uh, trading scheme. And also, what is interesting is uh, as climate uh, trend too, as climate ambitions increase, so does the relevance of emissions trading. So remember, talking about the uh, uh, climate ambition uh, from Paris Agreement or from COP26. So I think as the ambition grows, remember also creating demand for carbon uh, credits because the 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 the, the, uh, the higher the ambition, we are saying that particular country or the world should then reduce more. Uh, greenhouse gases or harmful greenhouse gases, thereby creating even a bigger carbon market. So this is why the trend too are saying as climate ambitions increase, so does the relevance of emissions trading. There is a clear 
correlation between policies and carbon prices. And the EU midterm climate target provided predictability to the various internal stakeholders, especially businesses. And climate targets also showed the outside world that the continent is committed to uh, doing its fair share. So what we are saying there, and also keeping in line with the Paris Agreement, what we are seeing here is this idea of saying when ambition uh, grows, then also there's a chance of the relevance of carbon uh, uh, of emissions trading scheme also growing or trading in emissions or even instituting uh, other carbon uh, taxation mechanisms. Stage number three, it says financial investors are increasingly uh, attached by um, attracted by carbon markets. Now, if the uh, financial invest investors are getting increasingly attracted by the carbon markets, then it also gives us uh, some kind of confidence in the in the market. So in 2021, trading data from the IC, uh, ICI exchange showed that non-compliance participants currently hold 20 to 25 percent of the long positions in the EU emissions uh, uh, trading scheme futures market. So this is why I say now the financial investors, uh, they are increasingly getting attracted uh, into the carbon market. And then that 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 trend is something to note about. And the last thing that I decided maybe to share with you as participants is that carbon border adjustments are, are rising, are raising these stakes. So when I say carbon border adjustments are raising these stakes, remember in one of the uh, uh, modules, I explained what do you mean by carbon? Uh, we, when we're doing the terminologies, I think it was module one. I explained what 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 do you mean by carbon uh, border adjustment uh, 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 mechanisms? And we are simply saying, it is when a country or a block says, you know what, we are we are we, we want to force your product to be to be to be um, either carbon neutral or less carbon intensive. So as such, if you produce your uh, I use the example of cement, a bag of cement. If you produce your bag of cement, maybe in, in Nigeria, we know there's Dankote, there is a great, a, a great, a net, a, a great uh, chain that is de dealing with with cement. So when, if for example, Dankote is going to produce a, a, its bag of cement using a, a diesel powered energy or uh, a coal fired power power uh, power electricity, then what it means then is that that bag of cement, is a, it has got what we call an inherent high carbon content. So when by the time you want to export it to Europe, they say, no, uh, just give us a second. This bag of cement, where is it coming from? It is coming from Nigeria. It is coming from South Africa, or it is coming from any other carbon intensive economy. Therefore, for us to protect our domestic market, let's then put a carbon border adjustment charge on that particular product, so almost like a a, a, a tariff barrier that will that that will come there for you a, a, in the form of additional a, a taxes for your product. So as long as then your product is carbon heavy, then it might actually get to to have a challenge. So for you to avoid that, it means you should then try to make your product carbon neutral. So in South Africa, we have had a situation where the uh, wine grape farmers. Uh, faced a situation around carbon border adjustments when their wine was going to Europe. And they say, because we are producing them using a, a carbon heavy electricity, then that wine has got an inherent high carbon content. So the country, actually the producers were forced then to not to package the wine, but then just to package it in bulk, not to, not to package it into bottles, just package it in bulk and export. And what then do you find? There will be job, job, job losses in that country or it may not only be South Africa, it could be any, it can be any other country. Because if the product that you are producing are not getting demand, it simply means you just have to scale down production. When you scale down production, you can't maintain your the same labor force. And these are some of the dynamics that are there when I'm talking about why should Africa then be networking into some of these global mechanisms so that it's not left too far behind the corner. So that we should also be part of that global movement but we should also uh, check and protect our interest. Let's move on to section two, that's going to talk about carbon taxation and design. It's a small activity there that will be of interest to you. Um, uh, the first one, 
how to design an effective carbon tax, just about four minutes. The other one was a webinar, about one hour, 38 minutes. You can do it at your own time. But there are interesting cases in there, uh, including South Africa, carbon taxation, national practice and international trends. I think make time to watch this video because also you might get some quiz questions from some of these videos. Multilateral cooperation and carbon taxation, challenges and opportunities, just uh, three hours. This one, you can watch it if you've got time. How Here, here is uh, what a carbon tax could mean for you, just five minutes. So I think the first, the last, and maybe the third, third video, clip, video clip there to be of interest to you. Now, when dealing with carbon taxation and design, it is important to differentiate between cap and trade versus carbon taxation systems. Now, this is uh, an interesting check that you might actually get also like a quiz question asking what is some of the difference between a, a carbon tax versus an emissions trading scheme. So let's 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 run down through this uh, table. Um, the source is there given on uh, on your power on a PowerPoint. Uh, so we've got the characteristics. We've got carbon tax. We've got emissions trading scheme. Let's start with the certainty of prices. So in a carbon tax, businesses are certain about the price of carbon emission. So, so as we talk about carbon market, and you're going to talk about the carbon taxation or carbon tax, then for an African government, if there are a lot of challenges or maybe there, there's no certainty in demand, you might then be forced to go the route of a carbon tax because businesses are certain about the price of carbon emissions, whereas in an emissions trading scheme, the price of emissions is not constant. So it, it, it varies. So I think we've seen those graphs that I showed earlier on, how the price was uh, fluctuating. Level of emissions, the level of, um, uh, uh, of uh, emissions varies in a carbon tax, and the level of emissions is constant as there is a set limit on the level of emissions. So in this case, remember companies are under, in the emissions trading scheme, the, the country has got its own carbon budget. From that carbon budget, it parcels it out to industries. Then the industry parcels that uh, their, 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 their quota uh, to, to industries. And then a certain industries or a particular industry knows exactly how much it has been allocated. So that's actually what happens in an emissions trading scheme. Whereas in a carbon tax, the level of emissions varies. And lastly, the mode of control. The level of carbon emitted is set per ton, which translates it on a tax on oil, electricity, or natural gas. Then the limit of emissions is by offering permits for every ton of carbon dioxide is which is produced. So these are some of the differences that uh, you, you, you can get, but there could be many more, and you can also uh, do your own research. Now. Carbon taxation and, uh, and design. What is carbon taxation? One might want to ask. So this is some of the information that I picked from uh, uh, um, a source there called uh, um, uh, Pare in 2019. So it said carbon taxes have a central role in reducing greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we know. And the carbon tax could discourage the use of fossil fuels resulting in a shift to less polluting fuels thereby limiting the carbon dioxide emissions that are by far the most prevalent greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So what we are simply saying there is that the purpose of a carbon tax is not to generate another tax revenue for, for the government. I know uh, there are many instances when a, a carbon tax has just been introduced. I won't mention some of these countries, but they are there, but just as a, another form of a tax revenue. So then that, that, that gives us a very bad picture in terms of us, the consumers or the citizens, if a government is trying to manipulate the carbon tax just as another form of revenue. We are saying it should be put in place as a form of environmental stewardship to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon taxes levied on coal, oil products and natural gas in proportion to their carbon content can be collected from fuel suppliers. They in turn will pass on the tax in the form of higher prices, for electricity, petrol, heating, oil, and so on uh, to, the, to the consumers. Now, the interesting part is a carbon tax may therefore provide incentives for both the producers and the consumers to reduce energy use and shift to low carbon fuels or renewable energy sources through investment or behavior. While uh, addressing climate change by reducing greenhouse gases, carbon taxes may also generate environmental and health benefits through the reduction of deaths from local air pollution. And lastly, the carbon taxation 
further raise significant revenue, raise significant revenue for governments, and such revenue could be used to counter economic, counteract economic harm caused by higher fuel prices. So we, we, we want a situation where these revenues are going to be used, number one, to address environmental challenges. I know a, a, a lot of governments, they don't want to ring fence uh, their tax, uh, tax revenues. Uh, so whether it's a carbon tax or it's another tax, it could be a, a ticket fine by a driver. They all go into the same pot of national treasury. The national treasury in its wisdom then also allocates the budget accordingly. But in I think in some few instances, there are uh, certain circumstances where the carbon taxation can be ring-fenced, very, very, very uh, um, contradictory uh, the, uh, when you ring-fence because, really, like I was saying, national treasuries don't want funds to be ring-fenced. Otherwise, they end up with lots of other revenues that are being ring-fenced. Now, governments may use carbon tax revenue to ease the burden of taxation on workers by lowering personal income and payroll taxes. Carbon tax revenue could also fund productive investments that may assist in the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, that is SDGs, and compared to carbon taxation, other policies seem to be less effective. And these include incentives for renewable power generation that may not trigger switching from coal to gas or from these fuels to nuclear uh, of, the, uh, of the reduction in electricity com uh, consumption. Now, uh, taxation has other advantages. And uh, among those advantages, we have got the following. Uh, carbon tax, uh, taxes are a straightforward carbon pricing instrument from an administrative uh, administrative perspective. So we discover a lot of politicians and government, they like a carbon tax because it's just straightforward. They can be comprehensively applied, for example, at the point of uh, processing or refining for coal, petroleum product or natural gas. And in addition, carbon taxes can provide certainty of a future trajectory of emission price, emissions prices and revenues accrue directly to finance ministries. Ah, finance ministries, they would definitely like this. Now, if there are uh, proper emission monitoring capacity, variants of carbon taxes can be applied to other sources of greenhouse gases, such as emissions from forestry, international transportation, cement manufacturing, mining, and drilling activities. And to this end, carbon taxation will play a fundamental role in achieving the Paris Agreement pledges, not only from COP26 uh, or and, 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 and before, but also into the future as our nationally determined contributions are regularly revised after every five years, like we covered in one of the modules. Now, the next figure uh, in the slide provides a broader sense of the effectiveness of different levels of carbon taxes. So they are talking about the effectiveness there, uh, 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 where reduction resulting from say $35 per ton, $70 per ton, ETC. So we're saying there at different levels of carbon taxation and possible effects. Then what is coming there is like for countries such as China, India, and South Africa that are heavy coal users, even a $35 per ton carbon tax is extremely effective in reducing overall emissions. So we discovered that depending on how dirty your economy or industry is in terms of using fossil fuel, even in like a low a carbon taxation, like you're just using $35 per ton of carbon dioxide, can actually result in very significant movements in terms of adjusting to cleaner energy for countries that are heavy polluters. I've used these ones uh, in China and India and South Africa because I'm trying to pitch a, a developing countries and also pick South Africa there. I can include Nigeria, I can include Angola, I can include now Ghana, Kenya, all these all discovering countries, Mozambique, I can include DRC, I can so all these 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 countries on the continent that are that are that are I can include Egypt, Morocco, these countries that are producing uh, 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 oil, then they can actually be uh, at thirty five dollars per ton can bring some movement in terms of uh, to going towards cleaner uh, energies. Most immediate challenge, however, is moving mitigation policy forward at the national level. So carbon taxation can be politically very difficult. Now, why is it that a carbon taxation can be very politically difficult? It is that uh, carbon taxes should be introduced gradually 
with targeted assistance for low-income households, trade-dependent industry, and vulnerable workers. So as we talk about um, uh, moving towards, uh, now the buzzword these days is just transition. So in South Africa, we even have the JETP, which is just energy transition. The, just, the, the, the documentation or the policy, uh, strategic policy document has just been approved. And now, so I'm saying then, when we're talking about now the just uh, transition uh, within this context of net zero by 2050 or ju just energy transition, we are saying they are actually uh, set force that can come like right now they if if you've got an abrupt uh, stop in using coal then it's going to be uh, detrimental to the economy remember i spoke about the the movement from the uh, fair coal phase out to draw down so the idea of drawdown was almost like uh, trying to address this and even carbon taxation if it is too harsh then it can also have even this consequence that you're trying to avoid where industry can immediately shut down and uh, household incomes can be lost, then we've got also a uh, trade in the dependent industry getting seriously affected, then workers become vulnerable and they can be dismissed or laid off, all that kind of stuff can come. The rationale for reform and the use of revenues must be clearly communicated to the public with other instruments needed to enforce carbon pricing or substitute for it. So they were saying as you governments or you want to use carbon taxation as one of the instruments in the carbon market or to address climate change, what is that is needed is to communicate this to the to the to the public. And that communication needs to be very clear so that the, the masses move with you. Otherwise they will end up having revolts uh, in your in, in our countries because people are, are fighting against any other form of tax after carbon taxes have been introduced. Well, there is a good movement with more than 50 carbon tax and emission trading schemes now operated uh, uh, at the regional, national, and sub-national level. The global average carbon price has remained ridiculously low, on average, just about $2 per ton. Now, this is where the challenge is. So if we've got our global average uh, carbon, uh, carbon price being $2 per ton, then an industry can happily pollute uh, and and even the manager is not is not worried because they can easily pay whatever fine the government needs to put if it, if there was a penalty because polluting will actually pay more than not polluting. So I think the the carbon taxation, the setting of the carbon uh, price must be at a level where it permits that there is a, a good deter deterrence for 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 polluting industries. Remember, uh, some of these guys are, are, are huge. They've got they've got resources, and and they, they might not even fear to pollute uh, because of those resources that they have. So we are saying the 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 rate of the the price of the carbon should be of that of the nature that allows uh, 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 that should be deterrent to make sure that the polluters don't continue doing that. So they, why we're saying, say, hence the ministries of finance should carefully craft policy packages to avoid broader uh, and stronger mitigation incentives, accounting for national efficiency, distributional and political economy considerations. Now, there's an interesting uh, case study that I decided to, to, to sit here when I, was, when I was preparing the material I, I when I visited the UNFCCC website, I I discovered this this they were talking about this concept of revenue neutral carbon taxation. Then I, I got curious curious to see what was it. So here is a very good intro, is a, a very good example from the Canadian province of British Columbia that I'm going to run through with you and see what was happening there in terms of the carbon uh, taxation. I'm also going to narrow down to South Africa because I think it's one of the countries in Africa that is advanced in terms of the carbon taxation, also is another case study. Other case studies you can then read on your own. In 2008, the Canadian province of uh, British Columbia pioneered the revenue neutral carbon tax applied to the purchase or use of fuel in British Columbia. The carbon tax remains the most comprehensive of its kind, covering approximately 70% of the provincial emissions. That is huge. So since the tax is revenue neutral, so what that means is like every dollar generated is retained to British Columbians in the form of personal and business tax measures, such as reductions in personal income tax rates, the low income 
climate uh, action tax credit and corporate income tax uh, uh, reduction units. We, we are seeing that uh, the government uh, the, the British Columbia uh, uh, province uh, government, provincial government, did not uh, uh, want to have an, another tax revenue. So apart from uh, being another tax revenue, but that particular tax revenue is almost being spread into the system so that it becomes revenue neutral. So by revenue neutral, they say the government is, is, is basically reinvesting uh, the money that it gets from uh, from the uh, uh, from British Columbians in the form of personal and business tax measures such as reductions in pay, personal income tax and also low income climate tax uh, action tax credit and of course corporate income tax reduction. So you could actually look at the British Columbia tax revenue uh, carbon tax uh, on this two minute video. Then you can also go and read further. Now the revenue. Uh, new carbon tax is estimated to have reduced the emissions in the province by up to 15% from what they would have otherwise been. And of course, the same research that was done by Mara in 2015 indicates that the tax has uh, had negligent effects on overall economic performance as between 2007 and 2014, the test real GDP growth domestic product grew 12.4% stronger than the Canadian average. And of course, the West Coast Clean Economy's 2010-2014 jobs update notes that there were 60, uh, 68,165,000, 68,000, 68, and 165 jobs, clean uh, energy jobs, uh, a 12 percent increase uh, since uh, 2010, with a, a clean tech sector of approximately 200 firms generating an estimated Canadian dollars 1.5 billion in revenue. I think the the, the, the world, this one slide is just showing the positive that came from the that British Columbia uh, uh, revenue tax, uh, 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 carbon uh, revenue uh, carbon uh, revenue tax mechanism. Then given its success story, the World Bank and the United Nations have identified British Columbia revenue neutral carbon tax as a model to follow. So what, what this slide is concluding is like, if your government uh, or your organization wants to know more about this um, revenue neutral carbon tax, the, the place to be is British Columbia. So you, you could, maybe there could be others, but I think from the World Bank, United Nations, this has been a, a, a identified is the one of the case studies that has done uh, what was intended to be done. So the carbon tax is an example of how to get carbon pricing right. Okay, you can also go again, and uh, we are now studying uh, possibly on activities for South Africa. Uh, just one minute, uh, two minute uh, uh, YouTube slide uh, videos that you can watch. Now, it's also important for us then to say. We've spoken about uh, British Columbia, we've spoken about what's happening in China, South Korea, and New Zealand, but on the African continent, in terms of carbon taxation, what is it that is happening? So what I've decided here is like to uh, go to the uh, National Treasury uh, in South Africa, the, which is the entity that is, uh, that is actually in charge or spearheading uh, the carbon taxation in South Africa. So uh, part of this, some of these slides are from the slide that they've presented in many platforms, and you can maybe also possibly find them on the internet. So South Africa is among the top 20 emitters of greenhouse gases globally. And as such, the country made commitments under the 2015 Paris Agreement to further reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. So the commitments to cut emissions are set out in the second and even the third nationally determined contributions that were submitted to the UNFCCC at the COP26. Now you would discover when you read in the literature, uh, uh, traditionally from the long-term mitigation scenario of South Africa, the story was we need to peak plateau and decline. So this peak plateau and decline trajectory, it was in terms of the uh, carbon emissions. But as the, the, the work is being revised now, the, the the, the plateauing uh, part has been uh, reduced drastically. And now the narrative is saying, we need to pick to about 2026 and start declining thereafter. Whereas originally it was, you need to pick and uh, about 2020, uh, 20, about 20, uh, 2030, if I'm not mistaken, then from about 20, 2030, you, 2035, you can start to decline. 
So that is, that idea of saying our 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 greenhouse gas emissions as a country should be should be going up to a certain level, maybe 2025, 20, 2026, 20, 2030, then thereabouts they start peak plateauing flat for about five or so years, then they start declining about 2035. 20, so then that narrative, remember saying that was the old narrative. So what has come now is let the greenhouse gas emissions peak to about 2026, 20, 2027, thereabouts, then they start declining. So as to bring the issue of ambition that we're talking about earlier on. So they are saying now the commitment requires a peaking of greenhouse gas emissions by 2025 in the range of 398 to 510 megatons uh, of, of, of greenhouse gas emissions and a sharp decline in emissions from 2026 20, onwards in the range of 350 to 420 metric tons. So so, uh, yeah. so what is imagining here is like that change in narrative for the South African government is now being brought in the NDCs. So remember in the long-term mitigation scenario of about 2020, 2008, peak, plateau, and decline. Now in the revised indices of, uh, that were submitted to, to, uh, during COP26 uh, last year, is saying peak by 2025. And up there after 2026, we have to have a sharp decline. So I think that sharp decline is also going to speak to the jet uh, in, uh, just energy transition uh, uh, trajectory that is on the table in the country right now. <clears throat> so the South African NDC notes the carbon tax is an important component of the mitigation policy strategy, which is good because when the NDC is, uh, is saying carbon tax is going to be one of the mechanisms, so we are also institutionalizing it. And the carbon tax also forms an integral part of climate change response policy package under the National Climate Change White Paper 2011 and also the National Development Plan 2004. It was also the uh, carbon tax, uh, tax act that was uh, put in place by 2019, and it gives effect to the polluter pays principle and helps to ensure that firms and consumers take these costs into account in their uh, in, in their future production, consumption, and investment decisions. And to help sectors transition, in addition in addition to the tax free allowances, revenue recycling measures have been implemented as part of package of support measures under the carbon tax. For example, reducing, uh, reducing other taxes, tax incentives, and targeted on budget programs, almost similar to the British Columbia system, which is good. For the first phase of the carbon tax, <coughs> which is until, excuse me, which is until 2025, the introduction of the tax will have a neutral impact on the price of electricity to cushion low income households and energy intensive industries. Now, this is achieved by providing a credit for the payments of electricity generation levy and also credit for the renewable energy premium built into the electricity tariff. And in addition, businesses uh, uh, were already or are already or are are already benefiting from energy efficient savings tax incentives implemented in uh, November 2016. Now, the energy efficiency savings tax allowance was implemented in 2013 under Section 12L of the Income Tax Act. So we are also seeing that in the Income Tax Act of the country, then there are issues around energy efficiency saving taxes allowance that are given. So what we are simply saying here is it's also important to have the right policy regulatory framework in in place for your uh, for your carbon taxation regime. So you you can then just rock uh, have your the, the following day we want to institute a carbon tax because you have to have the regulatory uh, framework that supports that, including the income tax act and what other acts that that are coming and uh, environmental climate policies that are there. So all energy carriers in the country, apart from renewable energy producers, are eligible to claim uh, the 12 uh, uh, Income Tax Act Section 12L incentive. And this measure was specifically introduced as one of the options for potential revenue recycling, even though the carbon tax had not yet been introduced. The incentive allows businesses to claim deductions. Now, this is where the, the nitty gritties of this carbon taxation comes in. We are saying that that incentive allows businesses to claim deductions against their taxable income for energy efficiency, saving measures, 
measured in kilowatt hours equivalent. So the rate at which this deduction is calculated currently uh, was increased from 45 cents per kilowatt hour to 95 cents per kilowatt hour in 2015. And the South African National Energy Development Institute is responsible for monitoring and verif verification of energy efficient savings claims from taxpayers and issues a certificate to the taxpayer endorsing the saving. So what is happening now? Apart from putting that policy environment, there's also a body, a national board called SANEDI, in short, here in South Africa, we call it SANEDI, South African National Energy Development Institute, that has been given the responsibility to monitor and verify. Because any other Jack and Jill company can come or individual saying, I have saved carbon. Uh, by doing this, I've, I've instituted energy efficiency measures. And then if they're not verify, verified, then the purpose of the instrument will be lost. So the mining and manufacturing sectors are the largest beneficiaries of this incentive. And initial analysis suggests that the monetary value or subsidy for energy efficiency uh, investment is about 3 billion uh, rand. Uh, I think as of today, the rand is, uh, is, is, is about 1769 or 1760 there are bars to the to the dollar. National um, uh, Treasury uh, 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 extended the duration of the energy efficient saving incentive to the align to to be aligned with the first phase of the carbon tax in the budget uh, 2020 2019. By the way, I said uh, the exchange rate today. It's um, I think today it's uh, let me check the correct date. Today is 19 September, uh, 20. 22. So when I was giving that the exchange rate range to dollar is uh, uh, 1760 thereabouts, I mean, as of today, which is 19 September 2022. There are also additional green tax incentives worth mentioning from South Africa, and these include accelerated depreciation allowance for renewable electricity generation and biofuels production for machinery. This apply, uh, applies uh, to electricity pro uh, production from sources such as wind, hydropower, and solar energy. There's also a research and development tax incentives that in, uh, including green technologies, which 150% income tax reduction uh, deduction or expenditure incurred directly for research and development. Uh, we also have tax incentives for biodiversity conservation to promote biodiversity preservation in the country. And lastly, the, the, incentive, uh, uh, the incentive allows uh, a land owners to take, to have a reduced tax base based on the value of the area of their land that was protected as either a nature reserve or a national park. Now, there were also a carbon tax uh, uh, proposal uh, announced uh, in 2022 budget. So this is quite interesting. Now we see the budget Talking so it's almost things that call about uh, budget taking, uh, carbon tax, uh, uh, budget uh, carbon tax uh, 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 tagged in 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 the budget. So the 2022 budget actually they had carbon tax uh, proposals uh, seated in there. So the carbon tax rate in that 2022 budget, one of the proposal, the carbon tax rate was supposed to be adjusted, uh, effective one January 2022, with 144 rand per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. Then you see, originally I think it was talking about 120 rand per ton. Now we are seeing it coming uh, 100, at 144. So the idea is again to bring a deterrent, not then to kill the industry, but then to be environmentally friendly, and so that it can it can trigger the idea of reducing carbon emissions. Extension of the first phase uh, was pronounced, and this included the extension of the transitional allowances and revenue recycling measures for companies by three years ending in December 2025, which is good, starting from January 2023. The second phase of the carbon tax proposals, uh, they include ramping up of carbon tax from 2026 to 2050 and strengthening carbon price signals. So we see, remember, talk about carbon price signals. They are very important for industry. And from 2026, there's going to be a ramping up of this carbon tax so that we see exactly clearly that this transparency that we're talking about needs to be there as well. This aims to provide policy certainty to companies on the carbon price path over the short, medium, and long term to guide their planning and future investment decisions. Like we were saying there, the major 
emitters are companies who manufacture. Of course, they can pass the cost to the consumers, but the, 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 the government then targets the companies first and they are giving them a good price signals, short term, medium, medium term, long term and like we are saying remember that that ground that table that was comparing some of the advantages and what we said it needs to be looked for so when you're going to design a carbon taxation system in your country uh, then these are some of the issues that you need to 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 look at your carbon taxation needs to be embedded in policy we need monitoring and verification institutions we need projects on the ground we also need uh, signals in the short, medium, and long term, then that can make your carbon taxation regime a, a, a success. So measures from 2023 to 2025 include the following. So remember talking about now the signals. So the government is, is being upfront to give the signals to the to the to the to the to the companies. So in the short term, 2023 to 2025, extension of the efficiency uh, energy efficient savings tax incentive it's going to be there extended electricity price neutrality credit for electricity generation levy and revenue renewable energy purchases extended to december 2025 rate adjusted for 2023 to 2025 to be increased by a minimum of one us dollar to maintain price signal on the margin then the mandatory carbon budgeting system comes into effect 1 january 2023 at which time the carbon budget allowance of a 5% will be will fall away. I also measures planned to penalize emissions exceeding mandatory carbon budgets, which is good. So uh, when the, those things come in place, the, the, the industry already have what signals. However, to address concern about double penalties for companies under the carbon tax and carbon budgets, it is proposed that a higher carbon tax rate of 640 per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent will apply to greenhouse gas emissions exceeding the carbon budget. So then there's also, when you exceed your carbon budget, then what happens? You have a higher uh, uh, rate. Remember that the rate was about 144. Now you're now talking about 640 per tonne of carbon dioxide for those that maybe will be going higher. And of course, these amendments will be legislated once the climate change bill is enacted. Right now, as I speak, the climate change bill is actually at advanced levels uh, in terms of its uh, moving towards being enacted. So now we, we will have a, a, a white paper on climate change. We will have a, 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 the a National Development Plan. We will have the uh, carbon tax uh, to, uh, 2019. Then there is also amendment that are done to the income tax. And lastly, now we are going to have a climate change act that will be coming. So you can see all this policy environment need to, to talk to, 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 to one another. So for the second phase, government intends to increase the carbon price more rapidly, even year to at least every year, to at least $30 uh, by tw uh, 2030 per ton, accelerating uh, to higher levels uh, or by 2025, 2040, and up to $120 uh, uh, per ton beyond uh, 2050. So, so I think I like this idea of the pathway that is coming. Now you see, even the values, they are changed. Now they are no, no longer going to be in the rand. We are not talking about the global uh, currency that is there, the US dollar uh, so far, and, and, and they are now being pegged at that particular time, a uh, particular uh, currency. So the basic tax-free allowances will also be gradually reduced to strengthen the price signals under the carbon tax from 1 January 2026 to 31 December 2030. And to encourage investments in carbon offset projects, government intends to increase the carbon of, uh, offset allowance by 5% from January 2026. So you can see, uh, I think, uh, um, as I conclude this section, this, this slide quite is, is, is interesting in terms of how, how futuristic it is. And for, for countries that, that might want to then seed a carbon taxation, then the South African approach becomes a very good example. I'm not saying it's a best example. I'm saying it becomes a very good example or very good case study uh, upon which you might want to start. And because they are going ahead maybe of everybody else, then there could be lessons that are going to be learned from this particular carbon taxation system. Now, this moves us to uh, section three. 
uh, which is talking about tax incentives and subsidies solutions. You know, uh, uh, we, we like incentives, so I, I thought maybe it was necessary for me just to touch base with the tax incentives and subsidies solutions. Now, there are several policy incentives leading to tax incentives and subsidies that can be found in the literature. And of course, even in the South African system that we're talking about now, for carbon tax, there are incentives there. So among these policy and tax incentives are those aimed at addressing energy efficiency, that include subsidies, uh, exceptions and rebates, voluntary agreement, emissions trading schemes already discussed, and also obligations and tendering uh, schemes uh, that can come. So the next slide basically gives us some of the that we want to talk about there. So when we talk about the uh, subsidies, so uh, in terms of uh, type, uh, so we've got a type, advantage, weakness, and examples. So in this case, for example, subsidies, we've got it's a policy incentive and advantage efficient when well targeted. Weakness is costly, implementation issues, lack of fairness, all that kind of stuff. Then we can have tax exemptions and rebates. It's a policy incentive, efficient when well implemented, almost same uh, 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 weaknesses. Sweden and Denmark have been using that. Voluntary agreements, these are policy incentives. Then we've got also they are, uh, they are efficient and uh, success lies on the stringency of targets. We have seen the UK uh, uh, using that. We have got also things like emissions trading scheme, a policy incentive advantages, efficient in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, cost efficient, cheap, awareness spreading, and long term. Those are some of the disadvantages, not necessarily resulting in energy efficiency improvements, and at times not necessarily resulting in energy efficiency improvements in the short term. Canada, EU, US, Australia, energy efficient obligations, market based incentives. A type of policy there, cost efficient improvements in energy efficient, and also the at times unexpected cost may rise, need for proper monitoring. Uh, we have got white certificates in France. And lastly, the tendering schemes, market-based incentives, cost efficient improvements in energy efficiency, but unexpected cost may rise, need for proper monitoring as well. No overall saving target specific. We've seen this being applied in Switzerland, uh, Germany, Portugal, and the UK. Now, in November 2021, the People's Bank of China introduced a carbon emissions reduction facility to enable commercial and retail banks to borrow 60% of qualifying green loans from the central bank at an interest rate of 1.75%. Now, this was quite interesting. So uh, in terms of the incentives that is coming there to promote is around addressing carbon green investments. So the People's, uh, uh, People's Bank of China uh, said to 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 uh, commercial and retail banks, we are giving you actually a reduced uh, a lo a loans at, at reduced interest rates. Actually, they cut them by more than uh, fifty percent because that, uh, considering that the normal uh, people of Bank of China loan prime rate was closer to four percent, then it means these uh, commercial banks and retail banks got actually it's almost like uh, running away with it so we've got over it's close to maybe 60 percent reduction in terms of the interest rates and the purpose there was for uh, the carbon reduction facility uh, which was a significant benefit to the greening of the economy so there are some of the issues that can come incentives are also big in the electric vehicle sector and the support of renewable energy de deployments. So you would see that at times we might not have a, 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 a direct uh, a carbon taxation mechanism, but we can actually have tax incentives that result in carbon reductions. And I think if, for example, you put a tax incentives for electric vehicles, I know in South Af in Africa, we have very few uh, countries that have come out strongly promoting electric vehicles. Even here in South Africa, where even BMW, Nissan, Nissan Leaf, and other kind of, uh, big manufacturers have come on board now, the, the policy is not yet clear and the incentives are not yet uh, elaborated. So I'm saying that these are still gray areas that are even across the continent we need to do. Now, I'm bringing this up because uh, the carbon market is not for us to 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 compete with anybody. For me, a carbon taxation or the carbon market, the first the first prize is for you as a country to be a responsible steward to reduce carbon emissions. Of course, the second prize is to make sure that it also greatly benefit the development trajectory that we have. And the third 
which is actually a, a, a footnote, we need to make sure that that carbon taxation is not disadvantaging you as a country. Your interests also should be, should be looked after. The next slide presents the global map of the top 15 markets regarding electric vehicles deployments and where incentives are received. So this is quite an interesting fact. So those are some of the countries you can see on the map there. Uh, uh, post purchase, those are in red. Uh, point of sale, where the incentives are, are put, those are in green. And half point of sale, half point of purchase, those are in orange. So it's covered. there are some of the top 15 destinations that have put a tax incentive sub subsidies, especially for electric uh, 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 vehicles. Now, um, I think I will skip this. You can also read on your own uh, the details, the figures, because it might not really be um, a, a, a necessary for me to look at that. But I, no, no, maybe before, without skipping, I'll go maybe to the last column that say incentive type. So for Belgium, you discover there the incentive type is what they call tax benefit, Canada point of sale subsidy, China, point of sale subsidy. So it's like as you, as you, as you, as you buy, there, there's a subsidy there. France, uh, bonus, uh, malas or uh, uh, fee rebate, Germany, point of sale subsidy and rebate. Italy, point of sale subsidy. Japan, point of sale subsidy. Netherlands, registration tax incentive and point of sale subsidy. So what is coming here uh, in terms of if we're going to subsidize a, 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 a tax incentives for electric vehicles, the, the, the common one is point of sale. So that means it can easily also apply to some of our countries uh, here on the continent. Norway, again, VAT and purchase tax uh, exemption, point of sale, point of sale, point of sale, bonus, uh, point of sale, purchase income, uh, uh, post purchase income tax credit. So I think overall, like I was saying, the point of sale is the most uh, popular incentive that is coming to the ex, uh, electric vehicle industry. Now, we are moving now to the last section, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, section four, which is the design and ongoing emissions trading scheme. I will now move uh, uh, to the section. These are some of the uh, uh, YouTube videos you can you might want to see, carbon pricing. How does a cap and trade system work? Two minutes. What is a cap and trade? Two minutes. Webinar, one hour, 17 minutes. You can look at California Extended Cap and Trade Program. Inter very interesting. The EU Emissions Trading Scheme explained. You can get the three minutes. Now, places, uh, what a, a emissions trading, a cap and trade system places a limit on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that covered industries can emit in a single year. So in this case, for example, if you are saying you have a cap and trade that's covering oil and gas, steel manufacturing, cement, then these all these industries, they are given to say, in this year, for example, in the European Union, you are going to be emitting this amount of greenhouse gases. So like I'm saying, then they are going, they are then cascaded to each sector. So they will be cas cascaded to oil and gas, cement manufacturing, then steel manufacturing. Within that industry, then they also cascade them to the company level. So this actually now then the, how they are given the allowances, emissions allowances and the caps. Emissions of gases are measured by industry and reported to the government uh, or regulator uh, who monitors emissions and, and, and runs the program. So the system allocates what they call allowances or permits to companies and these allowances are distributed via allocation or opening. The main sectors that are usually covered in a cap and trade system are power sector, heavy industries, cement manufacture, metals, chemicals, oil and gas industry, ceramics, power and paper mining, forestry, agriculture. Now, for emission trading scheme to succeed, CAT 2020 proposes several readiness pillars as follows. Number one, it must have an environmental rational, it must have an economic rational, it must have credibility, it must be simple, simple simplicity, uh, considering equity matters, transparency, certainty, and inclusiveness or inclusive, inclusivity. So these are some of the pillars there. Then there are a number of steps. So there is, if, for example, now your country decides we are going to have an emissions trading scheme, it, it could be national, it could be regional, then the, the, the checklist for the 10 steps of emissions trading scheme are they, this that follows. You must decide on the scope. You must decide uh, uh, to set the cap. You must distribute the allowances. 
you must consider the use of, of, of offsets, you must decide on temporal flexibility, you must address price predictability and cost containment, you must ensure compliance and oversight, you must engage stakeholders, communicate and build capacities, you must consider linking, you must also consider implementing uh, impl to implement, evaluate and improve the system. So this you can actually get from the World Bank and other other, other sources that are there in the in your reading material. And like I always say, we will upload on, on, on your platform uh, this PowerPoint slide, this recording, the quizzes, and the narratives. Then, of course, the quizzes will be given three chances uh, to answer a 10 at a time from IDEM. So one of the interesting uh, st stage there is stakeholder mapping and objectives from one of the from one of the stages there. So remember, the stakeholders remain fundamental. So if you don't map your stakeholders properly and you want to establish an emissions trading scheme in the in the in the carbon markets, it's going to be problematic. So we are, I just decided to zoom in into one of the things. I'm not saying other stages are not important, but I think stakeholders remain fundamental. So when you are doing your stakeholder mapping there and the objectives, you want to build understanding and expertise, you also want to meet statutory obligations, you want to build acceptance and support, we call that buy-in, you also want to build credibility and trust. So when you do that, when you talk about the, the stakeholders that are really, really challenging that, that you want to look at, we know the government is a stakeholder, so it is a key role in emission, in, in emission trading design and implementation, but we also have what civil society to the left in terms of input on understanding and managing the emissions trading impacts. When you go clockwise again, Emissions trading participants that are directly affected and their data provides foundation for emission trading scheme. Firms not directly regulated, market service providers, you need them, other emissions trading uh, schemes, jurisdictions, general public, it's important so that they can support a key for social acceptance and also elect uh, um, electoral support. Then academics and researchers, they need, they, they help you in designing them. And lastly, the media. Hey, media acceptance and support for emission trading scheme is important for you to build credibility and trust. Imagine if one mega publisher just doesn't know what, what is being done here, it's just utter nonsense. And then for you to convince the public that have read from these reputable publishing houses, it's going to be a mammoth task. So as you map the stakeholders, when it, it's important, NGOs, for example, they can, they can make your emissions trading scheme crumble I was just following uh, the news last uh, yesterday, and I and I, I was reading Greenpeace. You have uh, uh, you have uh, blocked a Russian carrier that he had the gas uh, to offload in Finland. So you, you because of the war in Ukraine. So these actually NGOs and civil societies, they are powerful entities, and they need to be on board when you're designing these emissions uh, trading schemes. Then, of course, uh, you can also go step it in. How do you, it's now the network with other stages. So remember talking about engage stakeholders, communicate and build capacity. But then remember other stages that I highlighted there. We can uh, include stage one, say we decide the scope. When we decide the scope, we are saying the cap is adjusted as scope changes. In stage two, we are setting the cap, but it also links to distributing allowances. Then uh, deciding on the scope, or co scope also links to distribution of allowances. Whereas decide on temporal flexibility has got also linkages from step one, step two. So all this network, the web that then develops is interesting. Well, when, we, when we go to stage a, 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 a six, then you're talking about address uh, price uh, predictability and cost containment. And you can see other stages that are linked to that and whatever is going there. Almost some kind of a fishbone that is developing causes and impacts. All these things, stage seven, they ensure compliance and oversight covering across all the all the all the other steps that have been uh, included there in the in, in the diagram. So by the end of the day, you are saying. All those states are interlinked, they are interconnected. And when you're designing a cap and emissions trading scheme, you need to be aware of some. Then of course, sector coverage, I spoke about this, but uh, in this case, I want to like to show uh, even countries that are looking at that. So when you look at uh, industry, that's RGGI, I spoke about earlier, it's looking at industry. New Zealand, they're looking at forestry. New Zealand again, considering West uh, and, and the Republic of Korea in their cap and trade, 
domestic aviation, EU, New Zealand, Korea, Shanghai, they are looking at that. A power sector, we have got all this, uh, uh, Tokyo, Switzerland, they are looking at that. Buildings, uh, we have got Beijing, California, New Zealand, uh, Quebec, uh, those are cities, uh, Korea, all these, uh, there are a lot of also cities that are considering a uh, cap and trade in the, in, in, the, in the building sector. And lastly, then in the transport sector, we also have got Beijing, California, New Zealand, Quebec, and, and Republic of Korea. So there, there are a lot of uh, um, cap and trade system that are being said, some they are sectoral, some they are national, all that kind of stuff. And then what is interesting there, some stage uh, of carbon pricing as of 2017 there, so you, you discover um, more than 100 uh, countries uh, 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 are using uh, or considering using a carbon price. And what is coming there from the source is like, there are those in green uh, that have looked at uh, uh, the participates in international and domestic carbon pricing. Those that have got checkered green uh, participates in international carbon pricing only. Those that are in red considering participating in international carbon pricing in the future. And those that are in blue participates in domestic carbon pricing only. So you see what is happening there. Uh, for the blue, we have got South Africa and I think that the country, I'm not sure whether it's Nigeria or what. Uh, there's a country there just in blue no no it can't be nigeria because it's just over uh maybe the drc so it could be angola yeah maybe it could be Angola also so but we see there's a country there that is trying to uh to to uh, participate in domestic carbon pricing only but we also have got other countries that are in checkered that are just participating in international carbon pricing only so then the ones in red considering participating in international uh, uh pricing in the future so we, we have got countries there that are that we are we are seeing that want to get involved on the African uh, continent. Of course, this is for you just to check uh, where we are saying the carbon pricing around the world. U.S. dollars per ton average per country 2019 cap and trade and carbon taxes. So they are the ones in in orange. Those are the ones that are dealing with cap and trade. So definitely, you discover there's more countries that have gone for the. Uh, carbon price, uh, carbon tax, and of course the reason is obvious. Remember, we were speaking about easy to administer. So we discovered that Sweden quite big on carbon tax, and their their tax is huge one one hundred twenty nine dollars uh, ninety four cents per ton. And uh, Canada is all coming in strongly there, but we also have got South Africa. We South Africa. I'm trying to locate uh, South Africa in the in the graph there. $8.34 rand a ton, and this is a carbon tax. So these are some of the issues that we're talking about. Remember, I said uh, uh, the, 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 the carbon tax must be a deterrent enough. And of course, here, yeah, there are very few countries that have uh, uh, that are being engaging on the cap and trade. The rest of the countries are on the carbon tax section. And also, what is interesting there is uh, to look at the monitoring, reporting, and verification in the EU emission trading scheme. So there, according to the colors where it is blue, that's where a regulate, regulated entity, a regulator verifier. So for example, what, what uh, going clockwise, one January, uh, you start uh, start of monitoring period for the year. February, issuance of allowances, and that's a regulator. Uh, third one March, verification, uh, that's a verifier. Checking report, a regulator, 30 April, Surrender allowances for year, that's a, regulate, a regulated entity. Enforcement or sanctions regulator, 30 June submit improvement report for year one, uh, for the year, uh, that is a regulate, re regulated entity. 31 December submit changes to monitoring plan, a regulated entity, and also 31 December end of monitoring period for the year end regulated entity. So this is actually how it has been designed. All these stages remain fundamental if you want to put an emissions trading scheme. So the reason why we are using uh, this from outside South, uh, outside Africa is that we don't have emissions trading schemes on the continent. So really this then give us a good pointers if we want to institute our emissions uh, trading. And as usual, and of course, this may be the second last slide, of this recording, there will be your end of module quiz, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. The, the, the manner in which we set this end of 
module quizzes. They are meant to facilitate further learning. So it's not like a yes, no answer and a quick, quick, or a, a quick and dirty thing. We try to apply our minds, set this end of module quiz so that you can also enhance your learning through those quizzes. And of course, I thank you and for having listened to, to this slide, some of the highlights there, uh, the trends uh, in the in the in the architecture of in the anatomy of uh, carbon uh, 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 carbon market we're saying the prices are increasing and we're saying the ambition brings uh, 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 opens up the ga gap for that we also spoke around the uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, the, the the carbon taxation and also revenue neutral carbon taxation from british columbia and how good it is we also dwelt on South Africa. We saw especially its regulatory environment, uh, starting with the uh, 2008 long-term mitigation scenario, which brought the issue around peak, plateau, and decline. When then we also had its white paper on climate change uh, passed in 2011, and also the National Development Plan passed in 2012. Then we moved on to the uh, Carbon, uh, Carbon Tax Act, 2019, also amendments to the income tax uh, section 12L that allows for those incentives on energy efficiency. Then we moved also to the fact that the nationally determined contributions uh, uh, review, third and second review, and also submitted to the uh, during the COP26 brought ambition. So instead of picking twin uh, uh, and plateauing and decline, now there is a peak 2025, 2026 and a sharp decline thereafter, which is also talking a lot to the current debates on the just transition in the country in the uh, general, and also the just energy transition, which is a global pilot project uh, that is going to be implemented here in South Africa with uh, major global partners, including the UK, US, EU, and others. Then we moved on to emissions trading scheme, uh, also touched a bit on the differences between emissions trading scheme or cap and trade and the carbon taxation, talking about the flexibility and also the predictability, predictability all those issues that makes a, an emissions a trading scheme good and also the carbon uh, scheme good. But overall, we are saying there should be also a reasonable pricing of the carbon so that the mechanisms can permit uh, the, uh, the objective of reducing uh, uh, greenhouse uh, gases from the atmosphere. And we said it's always important as we engage with these carbon market mechanisms, we need to also place the interest of the continent, interest of your country uh, 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 forward and topmost so that as you relate with the carbon market, you also don't have to forget about your national uh, development uh, uh, agenda. And of course, uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, this module like I enjoyed it uh, in, in my recording. Thank you so much. Uh, have a blessed day.